Uh, welcome to the Strauss Center Space Policy Informational Video Series. My name is Alyssa Gessler, and I'm a Brumley Fellow specializing in space safety, security, and sustainability. Uh, today, I'm joined by Professor John Logsdon. Professor, thank you for your time this morning. We are thrilled to have you. Happy to be with you. So before um, we jump into our conversation, I'll just give a bit of background information on Professor Logsdon. Professor John Logsdon is an educator, author, analyst, and historian of the presidential decisions that have shaped the US space program since its inception. Professor Logsdon is also referred to as the Dean of Space Policy. He has been based at the George Washington University in Washington, DC since 1970, now as Professor Emeritus at the Space Policy Institute of GW's Elliott School of International Affairs. He founded the Space Policy Institute in 1987 and directed it until leaving active faculty status in 2008. In the years since, he has published three in-depth studies of presidential decision-making regarding the space program, one on John F. Kennedy, one on Nixon, and one on Reagan. He has also edited the recently published Penguin Book of Outer Space Exploration, a collection of original documents tracing the evolution of the US space effort. He is also a fellow and a board member of more institutions than time will allow me to list. And with that introduction, let's dive in. Did I miss any crucial details, Professor Logsdon? Not really. Not really? OK. Yeah, if I did. It's been a long career, so there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I figured I would do the abridged version. And I welcome you throughout our conversation to, to add any additional highlights from, from your, your very lengthy career and educational path. Um, and actually that relates to my very first question. So before digging into the more nitty gritty space policy stuff, um, I was hoping you could tell us a bit about your own educational and career path. So where did your interest in space policy first come from? And then how did you translate that into the career that you had? Well, it's not a straightforward path. Uh, <laughs> and the interest in space policy starts on a street in Manhattan but I'll come to that. I mean, I'm old enough to remember Sputnik, but I don't. I'm old enough to remember Kennedy saying we should go to the moon, but I don't. So the first really vivid space memory I have is John Glenn's orbital flight in February of 1962. And I was working as a technical writer in Manhattan at that point. And I went to see it's hard to say how to call John. Uh, later, Senator Glenn, John Glenn, parade through the streets of Manhattan together with uh, Vice President Lyndon Johnson. So uh, the parade went by a couple of uh, blocks from my office. I watched it and I, I noticed the excitement. I said, hey, this space stuff is interesting. Uh, maybe I should find out more about it. So that's data point one. Data point two is my first degree was in physics. I didn't learn much science. I was a fairly good writer and, 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 and turned out explainer. Uh, so I was working as a technical writer on military weapon systems uh, and, and uh, for a small company and taking clients to two martini lunches at age 23 or 24. And I decided that's not the way I wanted to spend my life. So I went back to graduate school at New York University in the fall of 62. And from the get-go with this newfound interest in space, wrote all my papers on space topics, ended up writing a dissertation. First would fit your profile. Uh, the first title was the foreign policy uses of the US space program. Uh, this is 1967, man. Uh, and as I began my research, I found all those uses were bound up in Kennedy's decision to go to the moon. So I did a PhD dissertation between 67 and 69 on the decision to go to the moon. And most of the people that were involved in that decision were still around, not John Kennedy, of course. And I never got to talk to LBJ, but almost all of the people that worked for Kennedy, uh, the head of NASA, Jim Webb, was still in office, got interested in what I was doing and supported 
my work. And so uh, the book was published. The book was ready at the time of the Apollo 11 launch. Mm. And so I got to go. I wow. was there on July the 16th, 1969. And uh, I was teaching at Catholic University in Washington by them and discovered that there was a program at George Washington just down the street focused on science, space, and technology. And I spent a couple of years of campaigning to uh, get myself recruited to GW, uh, which happened, as you said, in September of 1970. And the rest is history, kind of. Uh, it, it, it was and is a natural place for my interests and, and, and a, a, a wonderful base for the kind of work I do. Yeah, that's such a such a wonderful um, story, especially just because you obviously were able to forge a path in a field that at the time, I imagine was just hardly known or even identified the role of space in US foreign policy. Well, there were, there were a few things. There was a professor named Vernon Van Dyke at mm. the University of Iowa, who in 1964, published a book called Power and Pride uh, that explained the roots of the US space program. And I found that uh, book very influential and, and, and basically wanted to build on it for my dissertation. So I mean, people say I invented the field of space policy. I think that's an exaggeration. There were others working in the area, but I was certainly one of the first. Right. Well, that's wonderful. And I might have to borrow the phrase that I just heard you say, campaigning to be recruited. That's excellent. I think that's how networking works. So I love that. <laughs> um, great. So I'd love to turn now, and, and you hinted at this a little bit in, in your last answer, but I'd love to turn now to discuss the role of the presidency in space policy. So as you illustrate throughout your books, the president can maintain a very outsized role in the crafting and realization of space policy. Could you describe the role of the president in this field by way and by way of historical anecdote, um, illustrate for us how presidents have exercised this authority differently? Well, uh, I think space is a presidential issue. Uh, presidential leadership shapes what the United States decides to do or not to do mm -hmm. in space. I mean, there have been presidents who have decided space is not a high priority area. Uh, Jimmy Carter probably being the, the leading example. Uh, and so uh, I think presidential leadership is a necessary but not sufficient condition for uh, a, a, a ambitious and, and, and future oriented space program. Each of the presidents that I've written about had a different attitude. Uh, uh, Kennedy was not a space enthusiast when he came to office, and uh, in a sense, never was. I mean, for Kennedy, uh, the issue was the Cold War competition with the Soviet Union for global leadership, and the Soviet Union had made space achievement uh, a symbol of global leadership, and so they defined the playing field, and particularly in after the launch of Yuri Gagarin 60 years ago uh, and the world reaction to that launch, Kennedy decided he had no choice but to accept the game that the Soviets had defined and compete in, in space. So he, he wrote a now classic memo. There's, it was a memo to LBJ, so there's a copy in the uh, Johnson Library in, in, in Austin asking uh, Johnson to lead a review to find, and I'm quoting now, uh, a space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win. Mm. And LBJ ran a quick review and the answer came back. The first thing the United States could do of dramatic character with a reasonable chance of, of doing it before the Soviet Union was sending people to the surface of the moon and thus was born Apollo. It had nothing to do with exploration or science or uh, human adventure, except as those are bound up in global perceptions of leadership. 
Uh, no president since then has had that same set of attitudes. The one that's come closest, I guess, is Donald J. Trump, much as I don't like admitting it. Uh, but, but Mr. Trump uh, issued an order in 2017, still in force, telling NASA to take us back to the moon and then on to Mars. And so that's what the current program is. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned sort of that, um, the legacy connection between JFK and, and Mr. Trump a little bit, um, because that relates to my next question, which is about, um, you know, having so much of our space policy uh, centered in the office of the president, I, I wonder if it can generate a possible lack of policy cohesion over time. So do our allies and adversaries ever get a sort of policy whiplash in tandem with the rotation of different presidents? Yes, uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, we, we have not been consistent in our policy. And as we engage others with us, particularly our allies, uh, it, it causes some uncertainty. Uh, I mean, Kennedy wanted a unilateral effort to demonstrate space leadership. And so uh, it was a US only operation. Uh, but in subsequent years, and it really started with Nixon, we have engaged our friends and allies with us on the shuttle and now most intimately on the International Space Station. And uh, as presidents change, and there's uncertainty of whether we're going forward with these programs. And now, uh, you know, we went from space station to George W. Bush saying we were going to go back to the moon and maybe not follow through on space station uh, to uh, Obama saying, no, not the moon, we're going to Mars uh, or someplace, but not the moon. Uh, uh, to mount Trump saying, yes, we're going back to the moon and we're going to do it with the private sector and with partners. It's been hard for other countries to, in a sense, trust the consistency of purpose in what the U.S. is doing in its, its most visible space programs. I mean, we've been fine on things like uh, uh, planetary, robotic planetary exploration other areas of space science, we've been consistent most of the time. But uh, in human space flight, and particularly on human space flight beyond Earth orbit, uh, there have been ups and downs as presidents come and go. Interesting. Yeah. And it, you know, I, I was tempted to ask if you saw any possible remedy for this volatility in our space policy, but I imagine. Um, it, it's baked into our constitution. So this, this might sort of be our lot. Well, I think uh, that one of the problems, Alyssa, is that there, is, there was a compelling reason to go to the moon in the 60s, which was to beat the Soviet Union. There is no really compelling reason to put humans in space, except we want to. Yeah. And, and it's been defined as something great nations do. But uh, the, the kind of, of, of motivation that drives presidential decisions uh, has not been there. And uh, the reality is that the American public rates other things in space higher than space exploration and human exploration. So it needs presidential leadership, and I, I, you know, it's my point of view that it's it, it the leadership can't come from Congress; it must come from the White House in order to uh, convince the American public this is something that they want to uh, have their tax dollars spent for. Now, you know, almost full stop. Now we have people like uh, Jeff, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk who want to do it on their own with their own resources. But you know that's a different story. Right. But that actually hints at the next story I was hoping to get into. So I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned some private sector actors. Um, 
You dedicate a chapter of your book on Reagan's space policy to commercialization, and you noted that the 1982 statement of national space policy was the first time a governmental role in encouraging commercial space activity had ever been called out in national space policy. So could you tell us a little bit more about Reagan's approach to the role of the private sector in outer space? And also, I'd love if you could tease out the why. So what sort of advantages did he see to this opportunity? Did he under, like, did he do any sort of cost benefit analysis when thinking about the role of the private sector in space? Like, let us see into his, his thinking a bit, if you can. The funny image of Ronald Reagan and cost benefit analysis. <laughs> That's not how he thought after all. Uh, Mr. Reagan was a visionary. He thought in, in very broad terms. Uh, and he was fully convinced uh, about the efficacy of the private sector and of, 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 of the ability of, of, as he would have said, free men freely choosing to make choices that were in the general public interest. Uh, and, and, and so he was a, a great believer in the efficacy of the U.S. free enterprise system. Now, he didn't think much about how that translated into space, but people around him did mm -hmm. and brought to him the proposition that, that uh, there were possibilities for profit, there were possibilities for private initiative, and that the U.S. government should get out of the way of the uh, private sector. I mean, if, if you I can't say if you were a member, you weren't alive. Uh, but in his inaugural address, it said government is not the solution. Government is the problem. Mm. Uh, and so there were the folks who were true believers in the commercial potential of space that had influence with the Reagan administration, uh, got this policy statement you just quoted and a series of actions uh, in, in the following years. Uh, unfortunately, they were about three decades too early uh, for the actual reality. Uh, so not much happened mm -hmm. except establishing the principle that there would be a commercial space sector. Uh, but, but there was no there there when people went, went to try various initiatives. Interesting. So it was sort of a, a bit of a swing and a miss, but in terms of setting a precedent, it, it did make track, make grounds. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that, that, that the uh, policy actions that have made companies like SpaceX and Orbital Sciences uh, possible uh, and uh, originated in, in the Reagan space policy, even though, as I said, they took several decades uh, to, to turn them into reality. Great. Um, well, so with that, I'd like to stay on the topic of commercialization and, and sort of bring it to today. So um, obviously, you know, SpaceX is ramping up its launch pace. I think yesterday was its fifth launch over three weeks, and it also launched uh, 52 more Starlink satellites. We also have the upcoming clear space mission in 2025, which will be the first mission to remove a piece of orbital debris from space if it's successful, of course. Um, and then NASA's announcement of its regolith sol solicitation last September, which um, sort of established this, this role for the private sector in in situ resource um, utilization. So there's just all, all of these trends um, generally like a market increase in terms of commercial participation in the space sector. And I, I'd love, I'd welcome you to break out your crystal ball, if you will. So where are we going in terms of the role of the private sector in space and particularly with reference to Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty? Like how do states exercise ongoing supervision of these commercial activities? How do we regulate it? Um, are we going to see more regulation or are we going to sort of keep seeing this, this drip, drip, drip of, of policy, um, US policy rollout in terms of the commercial sector in space? So well, there's a lot to unpackage in that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, let's start with uh, government support of the private sector. Um, well, one thing that did come out of Reagan's 
period was the notion of a commercial launch sector mm -hmm. uh, and the assignment to the Department of Transportation to the responsibility of overseeing both promoting and regulating uh, private sector launch. Uh, so that's been there. It's not turned into a big business area, uh, but it's there. Um, I date back other areas to um, perhaps um, Mike Griffin as NASA administrator in around 2005, during the George W. Bush administration, uh, uh, Mike uh, said, you know, the government uh, uh, or the private sector wants government help. What can we do? Well, we can buy launches. So I'm going to buy supply launches to the International Space Station. And that involved, uh, evolved into what's now called the Commercial Cargo Program. Uh, it was first going to be uh, SpaceX and a company called Kistler Aerospace. And Kistler basically went bankrupt. So it, it turned to the SpaceX and Orbital Sciences, which is now part of Northrop Grumman, uh, who were guaranteed a business base if they developed a new rocket. And that business space was what allowed Elon to develop the Falcon series of rockets, particularly the Falcon 9 that now is, is launching every other day, it seems like. Uh, uh, at the same time, but Griffin said it was uh, premature, it was the idea of commercial crew, uh, of, of basically the private sector developing the spacecraft uh, to launch crew, to launch people into orbit uh, with the first guaranteed business base being launching people to the International Space Station. Uh, say Griffin didn't trust the private sector to do that at that point. It, it was up to the Obama administration uh, the deputy administrator of NASA, Lori Garver, at the time was a big promoter of commercial crew. And that program got started. And, and finally, last year, we had the first commercial crew launch. So that, that's kind of where the government is. As, as launches became cheaper, uh, as various business opportunities were seen, private sector entrepreneurs uh, have said, uh, well, there are business opportunities, let's try them. And the one you mentioned, debris removal is one of the ones, or on-orbit servicing. Uh, the first one that got a lot of attention was mining asteroids. There was a company called Planetary Resources founded, what, seven or eight years ago. Uh, that was going to rendezvous and, and extract resources from uh, 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 particularly metallic uh, asteroids. Uh, and that turned out to be premature and the company went belly up and no longer exists. So the market will operate. Uh, it's a long-winded way of saying all, there are a lot of ideas that maybe because launches are cheaper now, uh, because there's a more permissive environment, uh, uh, can be tried. Mm -hmm. And some of them will work and some of them will not work. Uh, the, the, the company uh, Rocket, Rocket Launch just had its second failure over the weekend of its Electron small launch vehicle. and probably going to be hard to stay in business. Uh, so, uh, in a sense, space is becoming an arena for private entrepreneurship with the accompanying reality that more businesses fail than succeed. Got it. So very much a, a startup culture approach to, to private sector entrepreneurship in, in space. Yeah, but people with money seem to think that there are some real opportunities. 
because there's a pretty high level of venture capital uh, and angel investment, uh, you know, in the in the order of billions of dollars a year, uh, uh, in in these various private space ventures. One thing, rolling back, is to remind listeners that the NASA budget is 23 to 24 billion dollars a year, a lot more than almost all of these private sector folks have available uh, uh, to them. Yeah, that's a very important note. Thank you for, for bringing that uh, quantitative aspect into our conversation, because it's really important to, to keep those proportions in mind. Um, great, so a, a bit of a pivot I was doing some digging in my preparation for our discussion today, and I stumbled upon a 1998 monograph you published under the auspices of the NASA History Division on the International Space Station. So given that the ISS is due to be retired likely before the end of the decade, could you tell us a bit about the legacy of the ISS and its impact on US space policy? Well, this is kind of a downer, I, uh, I guess. Uh, I, when NASA was getting ready to land on the moon, 1969, the issue under debate was what to do next. And NASA in 1968 and 69 decided what it wanted to do was, in a sense, go back to the original thought <coughs> of a long duration uh, outpost in low Earth orbit to get experience for uh, uh, long duration space flight, to qualify people for trips to Mars uh, or long stays in, in, in re reduced or zero gravity. Then the thought came, well, if you're gonna build one of these long duration orbital outposts, you probably need some sort of affordable logistics for it and it's something to go back and forth, something to shuttle. <laughs> and that's where the space shuttle came from. Then, in, in described in, in my Nixon, Nixon book, After Apollo, uh, there was no support for the space station. And NASA redefined the shuttle as the launch vehicle for everything and postponed the space station until Reagan. So that the NASA number one goal with the Reagan administration was getting approval for a space station. And it took 18 months in 82 and 83 before Mr. Reagan said, yes, let's do this. And that was the origin of the space station. There was a decision then to invite our friends and allies uh, in, 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 into the partnership. And again, this tinge of, of, of commercial interest uh, there were a number of people there arguing that research in microgravity could have billions of dollars of payoff. And that was one of the arguments that was very attractive to Reagan, uh, uh, given his uh, free market ideology, uh, that the station was going to be the, the engine of innovation for all kinds of, of commercial activity in space. Uh, so we started down the station. Uh, it's ugly. We don't want to discuss the next 10 years or so of, of changing designs and budgets and the attempts to cancel it. And, 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 and until the, Mr. Clinton was there, and it, the Russian leadership, the Soviet Union had collapsed. The Russian space leadership proposed to Clinton combining the Russian and US human space programs and their space stations into one thing. And that was accepted in 1993-94 to be the International Space Station. So then it's, it's become the, a thing that exists because it exists. Yeah. I think it's very difficult to point to research payoffs from the station that justify its annual expenses. Mm. So it's really a symbol of international cooperation, a symbol of, of human spaceflight, and an obstacle to resuming exploration because it costs $4 billion a year to operate. 
so I, I think the sooner we transition station to private operation, if anybody wants it, or dump it in the Pacific, which is would be very sad, uh, the more likely it is that we'll have the resources to resume human exploration. I think the, the hypothesis that there were things of research or economic value to be done in microgravity has been tested and shown to be false. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's a, a, a pretty skeptical view of the legacy of station, but I think it's my view anyway. Right. Well, I mean, it's important to to be skeptical when you're spending four billion dollars a year. And um, it does strike me, though, that 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 must be sort of a space policy elephant in the room, because you read a lot of op eds and articles that that really just glorify the ISS in terms of, you know, it's multilateral orientation and its diplomatic payoffs and, and all these things. But you really do have to balance that with with the cost and, and um, actual benefits that we're generating. From yeah, I, I've written that that the uh station and the shuttle to assemble it and now commercial crew to service it are mortgages on space exploration that, that the american public and the, and the white house are not willing to spend the money to do both the space station and exploration and so the reason it's been since 1972 that we have not gone beyond earth orbit i think is because of the money we spend on shuttle and station Interesting. That's a, a really important note. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I'm going to pull a passage from the introduction of that monograph that I really liked and, and see if we can relate it to today. Um, so you wrote the cooperative aspects of the program were an important, the program being the ISS program, right. were an important part of its propaganda aspects. The term propaganda has a somewhat negative connotation, but properly interpreted, it means an attempt to project or to propagate a positive message. The message sent to the world by the willingness of the United States to share the exploration of space with others is that of an open, dynamic, pioneering society eager to share its capabilities and achievements with others. I found this to be a really useful intellectual framework for understanding the role of message curation in US space policy. And I'm, I'm wondering if you would be willing to sort of, you know, given that message of the ISS, what propaganda message would you draft for Artemis? Is it is it the same sort of notion that, you know, the US leading this endeavor, but doing it with our allies for the benefit of all mankind, or, or is, it, is it a little different this time? Well, I think it's closer to that message than anything else. Um, uh, the, with the addition now with Artemis of saying not only other countries, but private actors mm. as part of the coalition to do it. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I think the, the message uh, intended for Artemis is in a sense, a combination of the message from Apollo U.S. leadership and the message from space station uh, in collaboration with other spacefaring countries. Yeah, excellent. And that addition of of the commercial sector makes good sense too. Um, but it doesn't. It certainly doesn't fit quite the same model as the ISS. So thank you for um, doing that thought exercise with us. Um, sort of related to that, I would also love to hear your thoughts on the role of values in the US space program. So we do see American values being integrated into space missions by the way of how we collaborate with allies, um, how we embed democratic ideals. And it's, it's all sort of framed in this way of, um, you know, bringing the liberal world order into outer space affairs. So could you sort of situate values into US space endeavors and, and maybe using historical anecdote or, or just policy frameworks, explain how we balance, you know, that value integration with our strategic interests. Uh, okay, that's a tricky question. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, is it value promotion or is it chauvinistic? Mm. Uh, uh, it's a fair question. Um, 
I, I go back, uh, Mike Griffin, when he was NASA administrator, was very explicit about this. Uh, and it was the Trump administration uh, with Scott Pace running the Space Council, my successor at GW, was also rather explicit. We want US values to be the values of uh, outposts and settlements in other parts of the solar system. Uh, <clears throat> there's an interesting, uh, I, all right, you said plug in some of my other things. I'm on the board of the Planetary Society. Mm -hmm. Our CEO is Bill Nye. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill has been promoting the importance of the search for life uh, in, in, in the universe. And uh, he asked a question of us over the weekend of how should we respond to if China now landing on Mars finds the life, uh, indications of life there. Uh, you know, is that a blow to Western values? Uh, uh, are they to be congratulated because the search for life is a human undertaking, not a US or a Chinese or anybody else? Uh, nationalistic undertaking. Uh, so uh, we, our, our policy has been that one reason we explore and, and think about uh, long duration stays on the moon, Mars, particularly Mars, is to make sure that our values and culture of Western society is spread into the solar system. Mm. Is that a good thing? If you agree with those values, probably. Is it also chauvinistic? Yes, uh, because there are other value sets held by other spacefaring countries that, uh, in a sense, compete for uh, uh, the values that that uh, underpin exploration. So, and that's a kind of convoluted response, but. Uh, I know I, I, I don't think it's it's uh, that straightforward. Right. It was a bit of a convoluted question, so I, I think it it warranted a convoluted response. But it's interesting to to think of that almost as a a test case for um, you know all of our U.S. space policy documents balance this American ideals, American values, but in order to align with the principles set by the Outer Space Treaty, we always embed that. Um, it's for the benefit of all mankind. It's for the benefit of all nations. Um, so it, it will be interesting to see, you know, if, if we are beat to some big space achievement, um, how do we respond to that? And, and how do we craft a narrative that, that lets us, you know, have our cake and, and eat it too? Yep. Very interesting. Well, we're, thank you. We're, we're used to being number one. Right. It's going to be a little uncomfortable if we ever aren't. I, I, I'm eager to, to read um, the narratives that come out of that. So. Um, great. So I, I'd love to turn to some current events. Um, you were recently quoted in the, a Business Insider piece discussing the Chinese rocket reentry. You said, uh, China in 2007 did an anti-satellite test that created a lot of debris and created a lot of international criticism. And they have not repeated that kind of test since then. So it's conceivable that international pressure could influence the next couple of launches. It strikes me that you said the next couple of launches and not all launches in perpetuity. Um, as you well know, there's a bit of a cyclical pattern wherein some highly visible space safety event happens, there's widespread public interest, and there's meaningful dialogue on an issue for this brief window in time. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, you know, how might we harness these moments, these critical visible incidents to uh, and translate them into sort of a, like long-term more sustainable policy outcomes or policy deliberations? Or is that, you know, impossible? No, it's not impossible. So just to clarify one mm -hmm. thing, I said the next couple of launches because we were talking about a particular launch vehicle, the Long March 5, right. which will be launched several more times as China assembles its space station. Mm -hmm. It's its first stage is the one that uh, seemingly did not have the ability for controlled reentry, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and so you know my comment was hopefully the international reaction can get China to modify that first stage for subsequent launches 
over the next couple of years. I mean, there is an international set of guidelines that say that this should not happen. And China violates those guidelines by uh, launching a, a, a very large initial sta core stage of a rocket without the ability to, to control its reentry. Mm -hmm. uh, broader issues. Uh, I'm sure in your work, you've been looking at the development of norms of good behavior in, in the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPUS, mm -hmm. at the UN. They're having, as we are recording this talk, they're doing a three-day seminar on, on uh, uh, the next steps in developing norms of good behavior. Uh, it, it, it is a, uh, I think the number one agenda item on the international space agenda is building on 17 norms of good behavior that came out of almost 10 years of discussion uh, in, in, in the COPOS context that deal only with near Earth orbit. So there are no generally accepted norms of any specific character that go beyond what are in the Outer Space Commit uh, uh, Treaty, which are very general in character. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, <coughs> uh, the next step in this norm creating process, which has been excruciatingly slow because of the way that, that the UN works. Uh, <laughs> So what, what's going on now? The United Kingdom last fall uh, uh, went outside of COPUS and, 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 and uh, uh, introduced and got passed the resolution to get states to begin to talk about norms of security threats in space mm -hmm. and norms of good behavior. Uh, and, and that process is say, uh, supposed to uh, happen again as the UN process uh, ramps up later this year uh, and, and uh, aims towards getting, you know, some people believe that the 67 Outer Space Treaty has been overtaken by events and should be revised to reflect current reality. Others say, no, we need more specific second or third order things uh, under the uh, rubric called space traffic management. Uh, uh, but a general recognition that we don't have a set of agreed upon norms of good behavior, much less uh, legally binding obligation on how to operate in space. Right, yeah, and very important distinction there. There's norms of behavior and then there's binding legal mechanisms. And I, I wonder which do you think is easier to achieve? Norms, I mean, it's what rubric do you measure that by, right? How can you say we've achieved the norm of transparency in space operations? Um, so that's a difficult question, obviously, but getting another outer space treaty is, I wouldn't say out of the cards, but consensus building is also quite difficult. So. Which do you think is, is the more likely way forward in terms of you know, increasing transparency, accountability, predictability in, in near Earth orbit? Well, uh, I think uh, there is some low hanging fruit that might be uh, the focus of uh, treaty building, treaty writing, uh, like uh, kinetic energy anti-satellite testing that creates the debris. It is conceivable <coughs> that there's enough international consensus that that's a bad thing, that, uh, it, it, that a treaty could be written. Uh, but for most areas of behavior, I think we're just at the start of a consensus building. I, the fact that we have these five existing UN treaties is really an artifact of the way the world was in the late 60s and early 70s, when only the United States and the Soviet Union were active in space. And if they agreed, you could get agreement. Uh, now you have you know, lots of countries, you have companies active in space and 
getting agreement on rules of the road is a much trickier process in 2021 than it was in 1967. Uh, so uh, I think it, in most areas, it is norm building, which perhaps downstream can be embodied in treaties. Uh, the problem with problem, uh, the reality with treaties is that there's no way of enforcing an outer space treaty anyway. Uh, there's never been an enforcement action on anything related to to the current body of international law, space law. Right, which is such a, a challenging piece of, or yeah, aspect of um, you know making these these international agreements impactful and and gaining the the respect that they need to be observed. Yeah, but most countries, most of the time, want to be seen as good uh, as pursuing good behavior. Uh, so there is a value in agreed upon uh, the the UN COPUS, which we talked about earlier now I think has 95 or 97 members <coughs> uh, and operates by consensus. So if something comes out of COPUS, it means that there has been agreement on, on that norm by all members. So that's no uh, minor achievement to get agreement. All the major spacefaring countries are members of COPUS, but there are a lot of countries uh, that are, aren't active in space that are also members. Right, which is wonderful having having that broad um, set of, of buy-in so that eventually when we have more states in space, ideally there's already this agreed upon set of principles. Yeah. Um, great, well, thank you for that. Um, to wrap up, I would love, um, as I mentioned, this series is it's for a, a general audience, but we, we especially target it at our students and, and students outside of UT who are interested in space policy and law. So I, I, I'm hoping you might be able to provide some advice or um, thoughts for students who are interested in pursuing this as an either educational path or a career path, any insight you might have. How do we um, you know, stay sharp, or how do we find good mentors, or what sort of resources do you advise us to to um, seek out? Well, the first self-serving advice is come to GW. <laughs> uh, I mean, we are a program in at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs, where people from both technical and non-technical backgrounds can study at the graduate level careers in space policy, space management, uh, space law. Uh, so there's, a, and the, there's a, a, an international equivalent of it called the International Space University. So that, that people interested in this area of human activity should look up. Uh, it, it's an intercultural, international, interdisciplinary uh, program built around space topics. Uh, that, that's been in existence uh, the first summer program was 1988, so now plus 30 plus years. Uh, uh, you ought to look at it. Yeah, it's a good say, experience that you, you, you would enjoy. Um, you don't have to have a technical background to work in the space arena, but it certainly helps. Uh, uh, and so the the ideal kind of person is someone with technical training that then uh, moves over into policy familiarity, policy uh, uh, training, uh, 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 policy research. Uh, and, and there are lots of interesting career paths. I, mean, I, I know the people that graduate from GW better than anybody else, and they populate the space community from the UN to uh, the White House to the Congress to major companies. I mean, there are career paths uh, of, of the combining uh, uh, with, with a, a primarily a policy or management focus. Uh, so uh, getting self, oneself visible, getting out. <coughs> there are both domestic and international meetings. There's a group called the Space Generation Advisory Committee, uh, which is people under 35 interested in space, getting involved in things like that. 
So the path is there. It's just uh, having the will, having the energy, having the motivation to pursue it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of that. And as a member of the Space Generation Advisory Council's uh, Law and Policy Task Force, we really appreciate the shout out. <laughs> Um, well, Dr. Logsdon, it has been an absolute joy to pick your brain today. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and we do hope to host you in person at some point in Austin, Texas. We will make sure that you are put up in uh, more appropriate accommodations than your last visit when it, you were here in the middle of South by Southwest and unable to secure an ideal hotel. So thank you again for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Good to talk with you.